to Akademie der Künste in Bundeskunsthalles Congress, The Future of Critique, running for five days, across the time span of 10 days, starting today, running until next week, November 26th, in Berlin. There's a lot of things happening at this Congress, beside talks, some things you might not even see or just subtly feel. If you see a person uh, who has something on their head or face, don't worry about them. If you see a person crying, you can approach that person and ask what's the matter. Um, there's also memes happening around that Congress. Um, one of the most funny and actually the, the biggest account for memes in art counted in reach is Freeze Magazine, our embedded critic, so to say, who comments this, this conference uh, with memes. And they are sitting also on this stage. But I just quickly want to introduce the moderator, Gregor Quack, an amazing art critic and uh, art scholar, just now writing his PhD on the work of Franz Erhard Walter. And um, yeah, memes versus museums, criticism after Instagram. Please enjoy. Hi. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I have the honor of being the moderator for this panel. I will try to keep myself in the background, but in the beginning I'll have to talk a little bit to introduce everyone um, on the stage. And I will start in seating order. Um, to my immediate right is Dina Yego. Um, and Dina Yego is an artist and a writer who is based in New York. Um, Yego is a founding member of the trend forecasting group K-Hole, which was a, was a collective um, that addressed lifestyle and cultural phenomena from 2010 to 2016. Some of you might be uh, familiar with, I think, the 2013 report on uh, norm, norm core. Um, and this and, uh, has since uh, been active in a bunch of other avenues, um, also and uh, importantly as, a, as an artist, and recent uh, solo and group shows as an artist have been at High Art in Paris, um, at the Franz Hals Museum in Harlem, at the Hammer Museum in LA. And very importantly for our conference, Dina is also a writer, a prolific and a very insightful writer who uh, covers um, and, and explains uh, sort of movements in digital culture. And though some of those important essays have appeared recently in the Eflux, in Eflux Journal, in Flash Art, and in Freeze Magazine, uh, the other one, um, the one with an I. Uh, in 2020, Adina also co-founded Applied Arts, which is an artistic, artist-led uh, strat strategic consultancy. Yes. All right. And to her right is Joshua Citarella. And Joshua is an artist and an internet culture researcher based in New York. He uh, wrote uh, and, and self-published um, the book Politogram at the Post Left in 2018, which is hopefully... Um, a publication that we can refer back to as we uh, in our conversation. And he also published in 2020 a book uh, called, or a, a document called 20 Interviews. Recent solo exhibitions um, have been at the Bass Fisher Inv Invitational in Miami, Florida, and at the Corseron School of the Arts and Design at George Washington University in DC. Um, he's the director of Do Not Research, which is an um, arts organization and online community that publishes writing, visual art, and more. If I can give you any of the many sort of links that one could uh, cite for Josh, uh, Josh's work, um, there is a conversation with, um, with new models who were on stage earlier, um, where they talk about some of the themes that I hope, hopefully will talk with from a slightly different angle um, in, in a minute. And to Josh's right is Chem a.k.a. Freeze Magazine, um, coming to us uh, somewhat anonymized, which is something that we may or may not uh, address later on. And Chem is an artist and curator who has a background in anthropology. Um, he is mostly known for running, uh, among other things known, for running the art meme page Freeze Magazine with two E's. Um, and since that page's inception in 2019, 
um, it's become an important tool for the creative collaboration between CHEM, fellow artists, researchers, and organizations. These memes on, on this account explore topics such as survival and alienation in the art world um, through a very reflexive, sometimes self-reflexive um, lens. He also, very interestingly, has worked as a curatorial assistant and as a curatorial worker, as a curator. Um, he has worked for, um, in, for institutions and events such as Documenta 15 in Kassel and uh, has had solo exhibitions um, including at the Barbican Center in London and at Versus Art Project in Istanbul. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome the three of you and wanted to start maybe with something that is a little bit, gives it a little bit more of an intro in your investment in the, this conference's topic and our, our panel's topic, Memes versus Museum. Because all three of you have lived and worked in some capacity in what we might think of as a traditional uh, old art world, and in some capacity have lived um, on something that, that one might call sort of a newer uh, place, a different place on the internet on, that is driven through social media and other digital, um, uh, digital forms of di distribution. And all, all three of you, to diff in different ways and different degrees, have chronicled and sort of theorized that shift from one to the other, and I was wondering if you could, if we could start uh, by you giving us your broad account of when you started to see in your life, in your career, when you started to see things shift from an older model to a newer model. Um, when was there a moment in general and in your career um, when that happened? And I'll start because you have written about some of these cultural shifts uh, with Dina. Um, they, um, when, when, how, how has that happened in, in your work and in your career? Yeah, I mean, I guess I could trace it back to 2011, at which point I was working on um, the website Arena, which is a community-based uh, knowledge aggregator, uh, ad-free, and developed by artists. Um, at the same time, I started working with K-Hole, where we were producing these trend forecasting reports as PDFs and making them freely available to both the arenas of art and commerce. And then the kind of third thread was that I was also, and have continued to have my own um, personal artistic practice. Um, I think between K-Hole and Arena, I was becoming more aware of uh, the ways in which we look at changing cultural and social mores and the relationships that uh, were happening in the commercial sphere, kind of grabbing from the art and cultural sector, cultural capitalism as we know it, um, and wanting to sort of look at the strategies that were being played out in that arena and make them known and give them names and language through which people could kind of talk about these forces that were being uh, enacted around them. Um, in addition to that, the language, primarily like language being the focus, would then circulate back into my own visual work. Mm -hmm. um. Is it okay if we if we go in in order of of, sure. of seating for now? Sure. Yeah, it's uh well, it's a, it's a such a big question. I <laughs> think um, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this of what shifted in creative life between like roughly 2010 and 2020, uh, and I think there are a few inflection points. I, I like to talk about 2012 as being this mass adoption curve for Facebook when it was no longer just you and your friends, but it was also your mom, dad, aunt, and uncle. <laughs> uh, 2013, I think, is also very significant in that my immediate peer group of uh, broadly post-internet generation artists all got their first solo shows in 2013. Bitcoin hit $1,000 and... Um, the internet very quickly became a real force rather than this thing we used to talk about being digital dualism where there's like the IRL and the URL and they, they don't touch. Uh, 2016 is a very important milestone as well, but I would say that broadly in that time frame, there's been, um, there's been a drain on uh, the 
the, the work that has gone into institutions for um, lack of resources and opportunity amongst the younger generation that have had to drift and find their way onto the platforms, right? So, so my framing for this conversation, which I think extends to cultural institutions, but also legacy media, where we could analogize, say, the New York Times versus Substack. We could also say that there are cultural institutions and then there's meme accounts, there's... Uh, a lack of uh, editorial oversight or, or gatekeepers, and um, those things can play out for better or worse. So I think uh, it's difficult to determine when exactly the inflection point is, but I would say within that time period, there's a decisive drift away from these um, legacy institutions and towards forms of alternative media. Great. Yeah, and you're right. It is it is the huge question, but we have a, we have at least a few minutes to discuss it, and we'll get back to to that. Um, to all those questions you already raised about how to evaluate that shift, apart from chronicling it, how, to, how do we operate in, in, in it, how do we evaluate it? Shem, do you want to close our little fire round? Uh, yeah, I think I have a slightly shorter timeline than my fellow panelists. Uh, for me, it really started like just before the pandemic that I have graduated from uh, school, like from university, and trying to get a job as a, like a non-EU uh, citizen in London. Uh, and like the difficulties uh, attached to that. And then as this was happening, uh, the pandemic hit, which um, obviously closed all of us in, indoors. And for me, that was a moment that um, I, I could just focus on making memes and focusing on that. And uh, it really coincided with uh, like almost like a vacuum in the art world that nothing was happening. And everyone was just uh, glued to their phones. Uh, and out of that, I think, I guess this year was for me the biggest change with uh, Documenta and everything, um, all the other projects I did around that. Because leading up to this, like last year, I did a, for me it was more about trying to balance between making memes, keeping them as digital as possible, while not saying no to opportunities in physical spaces uh, and physical, other physical objects like publishing zines uh, and so on. And yeah, it, it more entailed doing like installations about these artworks, about these, and try to be almost like an evangelist for art memes in institutional um, spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think that leads us right into, so our panel is called Memes versus Mu Museums. Um, the, we can also, I think, one, one sort of verbiage that we've, uh, that I've heard you talk about and that we've now been talking about for a couple minutes is um, this idea between institutions versus platforms. Institutions being things that you mentioned, Joshua, museums are, are institutions we're currently inside of one, um, but also perhaps since we're um, at a conference about criticism or critique or both, um, Legacy media, uh, newspapers, magazines, might at one point or another be institutions. And the interesting thing about all three of you is that you've been very active on both ends of, ends of uh, so both on platforms and on institutions. And I wanted to ask about your experience with that, first of all, but also um, about sort of what you've learned from that experience about, do you see those two, do you see Instagram and museums? Do you see legacy media and, uh, social media, always in conflict? Are they, for you, for you or in general, are they always in conflict? Do they have, are their incentive structures similar and compatible or no? And maybe since you mentioned Documenta, that must have been an experience, uh, um, uh, an, uh, an institution that was also covered quite widely uh, in the media. And you worked, you were sort of invited to Documenta in order to in, in inject some of, some of platform logic perhaps. And so, yeah. yeah, I think that um, my only objection to that, I think the this idea of like institutions versus individuals is like I think the wrong way to dissect this question. I think it's more about um, because first of all, you could say that as individuals, we are all trying to institutionalize ourselves. As a, being an established artist is also an attempt at becoming an institution in that way, and. I don't really see any difference between that and institutional institutions as organizational structures. You can even argue that uh, the most su successful artists in the art market do run their own institutions with their assistants, writers, and everything else. Um, so I, I think the separation works a bit differently. For me, it's more about who you 
collaborate with, who you work with, and their intentions. For example, I see a big difference between, um, for example, as Kolya mentioned, I'm like technically the embedded critic of this symposium, uh, even though that is a role that I am financially compensated for. I don't see any issue in that because this is very different than, I don't know, making memes for uh, a corporate structure for a for-profit business. Uh, and I think in that way, yeah, di dividing this in a way that is institutions, uh, individuals in, in, inside institutions, interacting with them, is I think the not the most uh, objective way to uh, look at it. And I, my other part of this experience was actually to also fight with this perception too, like also within Documenta that I actually, I don't know, maybe this would sound one-sided coming from me, but I had so much autonomy over, over what I could say or do with memes, but it was really more about working with people's expectations of how a singular institution Documenta is, for instance, and how, totally ignoring the politics within that, uh, different people who are there for different reasons. And uh, for example, I started by um, I actually, to keep my um, work separate and transparent, I, my first idea was to open a separate meme account called Documenta to post documentary related memes there. But then quickly I realized that actually that just seems sponsored and doesn't uh, fit the idea. And also people have a very, I think, romantic and idealized idea of how you are supposed to criticize institutions. I think same with anyone on this panel too, that like it's in the way that like, I think it is clear that everyone, like difficult to make money online just as in physical life. Uh, so I think this idealism around having to stick to just the digital space and only do that uh, is very, uh, skew like a skewed way of uh, looking at it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to us talking about mater the material realities of moving between uh, different uh, different platforms, and we'll 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 definitely get to that because I know all three of you have very specific and very well considered models of, of of getting paid for what you do sometimes. But if we could stick for one second uh, with the platform institution divide, and you don't have to agree with it, but uh, is is that at at all? I agree a, with it. Yeah. I, I think okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I think I might have. Yeah. I think I think I got it from the podcast that you. <laughs> well, uh, we should we should uh, mention new models yeah. was the uh, the platform in which it first appeared. But <coughs> excuse me. Maybe uh, if I could just sketch like a broad like you know diagrammatically like what are the differences. I have a Patreon. I also participate in uh, museums. There's uh, very different incentives and affordances in these spaces, right? So when you enter a museum or you log onto Instagram, right, you're, you're entering the space in which culture is presented to you, either through a feed or through a program. Uh, there is, I think we could analogize institutions to roughly some type of representative democracy in which there's decommodified spaces in which experts can confer about what program is presented to a public. But when you get onto a platform, there are all of these competitive dynamics about what holds your attention the most, uh, catering to libidinal, lizard brain type of uh, impulses. And uh, there's a real power law distribution of what excels in the platforms. And I've been able to experience this in a very practical way in the last few years because my practice exists half on the platforms and half in the institutions. And so I can see uh, it's not just that something outperforms by like a small margin, it's like 10 to one, 100 to one. Like you will be known for one meme that you put out there and that will outperform everything you have ever done to the extent that your entire career in totality, all the viewership may never eclipse this one meme that you put out many, many years ago. Uh, okay, so, so those things shape the type of culture that can be produced in these spaces in really, really dramatic ways. And I think, there are certainly uh, downsides, there are negatives to participating in institutions, part of the, uh, the drawback to representative democracies or uh, elite experts and, and all of the problems that come along with centralization is that they can be captured by elite interests, they may not be accountable to a public in a meaningful way, but uh, platforms as an alternative to that have 
instead created this, uh, I think what is broadly agreed upon as being the most disappointing period of culture you know, of all of the decades stacked up next to each other. You know, music is stagnant, culture is stagnant, art is repeating forms from decades past. And what we have today, if you show like, you know, what is emblematic of the type of culture that's produced in 20, uh, let's just say broadly the 2020s, you're probably going to put together an ensemble of TikTok memes. And that's just not uh, the same meaningful, enriching experience that institutions were able to do in decades prior. So uh, I, I think this is an important, I, I emphasize these points because a lot of my audience are recent graduates of BFA programs or they're younger people, maybe they run meme accounts or, or what have you, and they didn't straddle this divide of being between the two worlds. You know, when I studied photography in SVA, I learned it in a color dark room. <laughs> my professors were learning Photoshop alongside the students. And this is really before social media even hits that mass adoption curve. So the idea that there was a different way of organizing culture is a revolutionary paradigm shift to someone who is 19 or 20, 20 years old right now. Uh, yeah, so, so I try to, to hammer those points home. And what is very curious in, in articulating or elaborating these points now is that a lot of people of older generations seem to have forgotten them, right? So we're learning by, by touching our hand to the hot stove and getting burned over and over again that uh, platforms are just a very insufficient way of producing culture. They're producing things that are much more disappointing than in the past. And uh, someone needs to be the voice to remind people of what we have lost. And I see, I, I think this is the conflict that we'll get into at later points of the panel, but um, the incentives of platforms are so dramatically overpowering where in my own experience, you know, 10 to 1, 100 to 1, those ratios are, are sizable. But in the scope of YouTube, we're talking million to 1, you know, tens of millions to 1. And so what is going to happen to curation and that space in which decommodified decisions could be made when an up-and-coming curator has to turn... MoMA into the Museum of Ice Cream, it's going to be very difficult if we use those metrics of performance as a way of gauging the public's uh, reception of, of a piece of culture, a work of art, then I think we're headed down a pretty dystopian route. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I could add to that, I feel like beyond just the economics of um, you know, platform machinations, there's also the fact that in an art institution, there still is, you know, even as they might be steps towards it being a more democratic or open forum. It's still very much a top-down institution with curatorial vision and all of that um, being presented to a pretty clearly defined, even though, yeah, to pretty clearly defined niche public. Uh, whereas any kind of cultural, uh, you know, piece of content on, that once it gets shared on Instagram is just completely pancaked and leveled next to any other piece of content and it's like full on context collapse and an artwork is having to negotiate with like a hamster eating a bowl of ice cream and there's really, you know, no way to kind of compete with that. So I think that back to sort of like attention economies, that's what we're dealing with. You know, you have to deal with like the museum of ice cream massively outperforming MoMA attendance. Um, and that's the metric that new arts institutions are trying to sort of match up against because it comes down to just volumizing ticket sales and getting more foot traffic through the door. And we're seeing that with the sort of like experientialification of museums globally. I think um, that's, it's really interesting and sort of I was, uh, that, that on a panel memes versus, uh, versus museums, there's now a, uh, you know, it seems strike one for, for institutions, a defense of what has been, what, what might get lost in, um, in that transition, which I don't think we have to debate is happening and has been happening. Um, and I guess uh, the, the next logical question for me is what to do with that shift? How does one react to it? And uh, um, does one uh, save, like, for, for, let's, let's think about sort of, you, you talked uh, about institutions, Josh, as a, a decommodified space of experts conferring about, um, about, I don't know what you said, but um, if we talk about art criticism, that is one of the places that has stylized the expert um, from, from connoisseurship to, to art criticism. And I'm wondering if you think, uh, if, if in your three, th three views, is there a role for that, mo for that job, the art critic, the professional art critic, in, in, a, cha in, a, ch in a changing landscape? And if so, how, what, what good things about that role can be 
uh, can be rescued over, can be pulled out of, um, right. into, into, yeah. onto pitch, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, well, um, hmm. maybe uh, my, my collaborators, I'm sure, will be uh, very unhappy about this, but <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, <clears throat> excuse me, your collaborators on um, <clears throat> search, or? My collaborators from many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. This was in 2015. I used to run a meme account that had, uh, coincidentally, or perhaps, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, a uh, very similar name uh, <laughs> to uh, Freeze Magazine. It was called Freeze DE. And we, um, at the time, we had theorized that there was a severe lack of art criticism, that the magazines had essentially been captured by the galleries, and if you wrote a negative review, they would pull the ads. And I, what you generally see during like the last few decades in the American context, and I think to a degree in Europe, is that the increased cost of living, the increased cost of education, is that the people who can enter into these fields come from increasingly, increasingly privileged backgrounds, and they, they kind of all uh, gas each other up, reiterate the press release, and there's a severe lack of negative criticism, right? So the design of platforms themselves were supposed to amplify dissenting voices, and we had hoped that having an anonymous meme account uh, that was toothy, that like uh, put forward uh, criticisms that shaped public opinion, that that lack of, uh, to whatever degree that art is accountable to a public, the audience would begin to trust an anonymous meme account over the legacy publications like Freeze and Artform and so on and so forth, which is why we chose the name. Um, but I think, unfortunately, what we've seen in the past few years is that a lot of the accounts that really excelled in that space made content that was more so uh, relatable. It didn't, it didn't turn out that um, crowdfunding for art criticism is actually a very difficult thing to get, right? Because art serves a relatively small expert audience. There's Josh's podcast feed, there's new models and there's interdependence and there's a few other sub stacks and, and Patreons in there, but it's, it's really small considering the, the entire ecosystem and all of the publications, all of the content that's put out. Um, I'm not totally sure that there's a hunger for it. So um, what, do, what do you do in this process? Because one is tempted to make the claim that um, if there was a consolidation of... Um, you know, let's say compromised expert critical opinion in the magazines that like you just have to congratulate everyone to maintain a positive voice so that the asset price continues to rise. Um, you know, that's I think broadly disappointing to people who really care about, but then what are they gonna do? They're gonna go out on Substack or Patreon and try to uh, crowdfund their project that offers some kind of criticism. We've seen real-time experiments of this now where uh, Outland attempted to do this in, in NFTs. Um, but I think when you, even in the most compromised sense, when you talk about art criticism purely as a value add to a rising asset price, there are numerous, uh, m many blockchain, um, but also just regu regular like fractionalized ownership of uh, modernist paintings that are tremendously expensive and can be invested in uh, similar to a stock or something. Um, what those companies tend to find when they crunch the data is that its presence in a museum is not necessarily increasing the value so much. And when everything is flattened into uh, a financial asset, um, it turns out that criticism is increasingly, increasingly less important. So there were probably periods in the past where a museum, uh, a gallery, excuse me, a painting is shown in a gallery and then it's shown in a museum. Its presence in the museum increases the value of the painting. When the, the artist has the next show, the prices are a bit higher, right? This is, um, Institutions pay under the market rate, but you can capture the value elsewhere. That is shifting. That is part of this 10-year arc. And so I, I wonder if we enter a period of just, you know, pure liquid financialization where um, critical opinion is best uh, expressed as like dumping your milady collection, you know? <laughs> That's actually, that, that is the one anomalous example where uh, a piece of negative criticism did manage to crash the asset price of a, a bit of culture. But uh, broadly, I, I think I'm, I'm quite skeptical of the capacities for art criticism done on the platforms or in the institutions uh, at, at the moment. I don't know if there's a a place to be found for it. I, I'm trying to find it mm -hmm. through this route, but I obviously it's, it's still quite precarious and murky to me. Mm -hmm. Maybe just bring up 
the aspect of what audience we're talking about as who is the audience for art criticism, because I think that in a kind of uh, you know residual model that is this, it, it's a learned, educated, privileged uh, audience who is coming to a piece of criticism in order to like enrich their understanding of capital A art. Whereas now I would say that maybe the audience for an inst more of an institutional art criticism publication like Art Forum or Freeze is speaking more to like a cultural connoisseur of some sense that is really not um, not looking to art solely, but also kind of like leveling that along with, you know, reading Pete Wells in the New York Times and reading food criticism, reading music criticism, and that these sort of genre specifications are not necessarily the most helpful. And I think that, or t aren't very helpful today. And I think that the criticism that I find interesting, you know, what you guys are doing or new models, um, as well as the fact that it's speaking to a very like localized in the, you know, cozy internet sense audience. And I think that criticism that is emerging that speaks more to like social mayu or a specific scene is where, you know, the critical work happens now. It's speaking to an audience of peers almost. Mm -hmm. Jim, I was wondering because uh, I, I see your account sometimes as uniting uh, the idea of sort of a relatable art meme and also sort of a, a incisive, like having, having an opinion about sort of structures. And, um, and sort of, I, w I was wondering if, how, you, how you see the role of, do you, do you think of your account as being a critical account? Or um, is, is that, can you con combine that with the idea of being relatable, funny? Um, I, I, I'm, my interest is more about trying to uh, like bridge that gap, as you say, uh, that I think, because I think there are so many things you can say about the art world, about how corrupt it is, how there's so much market manipulation. You can even think about art criticism as a, as a tool for this too, unfortunately. Uh, but I think the, the biggest problem is that I think putting out facts like this doesn't really change this model or doesn't really um, make any significant change. People just turn their backs and just continue what they do. So I think it's important to kind of find a middle ground between that kind of, it's like a bit more fluid that is between like uh, just goofy critical, uh, goofy memes that make artists look references and while mixing that with a bit more critical, a bit more direct messages and then kind of creating a soup out of those. Uh, because I think, to add to uh, what the other said, I think also we're having this discussion against the backdrop, uh, or backdrop of just pure uh, precarity, financial precarity in physical and digital spaces. So obviously it's very difficult. And on the other side of this is things such as Gagosian announcing a board of directors almost ad adopting this almost corporate model or like making the uh, way for that. So I think it's a very... A critical moment uh, for the like broad, broader financial systems too, and I think we're all kind of in the same bandwagon. Well, then maybe that is the the in, the, the point where at which, we, which we turn to the material reality of it all, um, and and which which is always sort of a backbone between between all, behind all these developments. Um, so I think it's interesting, Shem, Shem, that you're saying. For you, the difference is also between accessibility, not so much between digital or analog, but also between uh, open and accessible and niche. And, and you, you said a similar thing, that there's a shift from an assumption of a general audience to an, a connoisseurship uh, a, a audience of peers. And I think one of the interesting things that we were talking about earlier um, is that in online spaces, it's sometimes counterintuitively uh, more financially smart to address smaller audiences. Or it can, uh, it can because there's different... Uh, uh, yeah, financial incentives. So maybe if we could, if as, as much as you're comfortable sharing, uh, all three of you, um, how, how, does, how does financial and sort of uh, having to pay rent concerns affect where you work um, and how you work there and how critical you can be? I don't know who wants to start. Dina? Yes, okay, so I, I don't have a... Yeah. Patreons, subs I, there's mm -hmm. no um, paid community aspect mm -hmm. of my practice. I s kind of started off, um, I feel like when I was coming up there in New York in undergrad, uh, there was this sort of like 
zombie formalist boom of people slightly older than me doing very well for themselves and making a living off of their work. That was not uh, you know, accessible to me or even necessarily of the most interest to me. Do we have to define zombie formalist? I will no, leave we don't that have to. to you. <laughs> want to do that. Um, but it kind of, I graduated into the recession, had this realization that all of the you know, publishing jobs that my peers would have been getting had just all kind of like vanished and the Condé Nast, you know, centralization of everything and just kind of woke up in 2010 to realize that everybody was working in branding and strategy in this more kind of like effusive marketing zone. Um, and K-Hole kind of emerged as a critique of that and also kind of playing with the form and also over the span of six years ended up being like pretty solidly recuperated into being a, a criticism of that into operating as the thing itself. It all became our day jobs. Um, now with applied arts as well, I kind of have continued on having this practice of doing branding and strategy consulting as a way to kind of fund my own art practice, but also because the ideas that kind of circulate in that sphere, the very specific economies of language and communication become the material for my art practice. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that's how I pay my rent. Yeah, so, so, so it's, they run parallel, one funds the other, but also intellectually inform, they, yeah. they intellectually inform one another mm -hmm. as well. And they're not in, do they ever come into conflict? Uh, no, I mean, there were a few like client NDAs that I kind of had to wait out. But <laughs> I think also just another thing to say <laughs> is that, um, you know, this promise that I could adjunct, be a professor, have that be the acceptable role that an artist can occupy, um, you know, I, I really you know, that, that's not accessible. That's not like a livable life in the States mm -hmm. at all. Um, so it's sort of been the crumbling of these institutions of like socially access acceptable things for artists to do in order to support their work and have kind of made it more central to my larger project to talk about like what people actually do have to do in order to make things mm -hmm. function. Yeah. Yeah, I, I quite like this model where you're... Um half your time is occupied with the primary sources of what your practice is about. And I think that's a very, um, uh, it, it's a very healthy, relevant type of practice because it's connected to the real world in some meaningful sense. Um, <clears throat> but I, <clears throat> I think that uh, what, we've, what we've kind of seen is that there's, um, although that may be the preferred model to, to work through, um, it's available for uh, increasingly few artists and that your time just tends to get occupied by one or the other and there's divergent paths. Um, maybe this relates to the uh, different types of monetization and the different incentives and affordances of these spaces, but um, maybe to try and, I, I'll just share like a quick anecdote for, for this Please. thing of like what you can say in one context and what you can't say in another, uh, that um, I wrote uh, the, the first book, if you can call it a book, I guess it was an essay with a lot of pictures. I, I won't congratulate myself too much. <laughs> it was like a 10,000 word essay with a lot of pictures. Uh, this, this um, it was in 2018 that I wrote it. I'd been working on it in the background for a while. And, the, and poli politogram. this was Politogram, the post left. Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't find, although memes had reshaped the national political discourse, everyone was uh, up in arms about these uh, you know, transgressive images on the internet. There was, no, there was no one in the art world who was interested to platform this stuff or to contribute resources to do the work. Um, I was able to get, uh, I, which I'm very grateful for, and I've been a huge supporter of Rhizome's program, I was able to get a small grant through them. Um, but, you know, the, the entire field, the relevance of this thing was of such a tremendous scale that you would hear about it every day. You would see it every day when you open the internet. And there was total silence from the art world. Like, absolutely nothing. I mean, there was like, what, like four panel discussions. <laughs> so the way that, like, all of the internet, all of this language about, you know, uh, the open source images and sharing and making aesthetic work that was, uh, you know, uh, engaged a public, like all of those things which seem to be implicit in the institution's mission statement that were in some ways captured by uh, 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 
made, made real in, in a new way through these communications technologies, there was total silence on the front of the art world. So what I did is that I went out and I crowdfunded resources to be able to publish on these topics. And then I wrote another book about it. I did lengthy interviews. I've uh, done numerous collaborative projects, two different books with people in that space. I've watched them go from being a radicalized 13-year-old to uh, de-radicalizing, um, joining a local, like, punk band in uh, uh, where they go to college. But um, the curious thing throughout this process is that the stuff that I wanted to write about, the radical memes themselves, going out onto the platforms then got me shadow banned on Instagram where I could reach like 10% of my audience for like almost two years, right? So in the program that we did with Rhizome at the New Museum Theater, I'm able to project these memes in a space in which they can be shown for contemplation and critical discourse. And then if you try to show it on the platform, you are removed. And can we... I, <clears throat> I know this is, everybody knows what it is, but nobody knows what is, what is, how did you experience and what is shadow banning in that context? Sure, sure. Um, uh, shadow banning is a, um, it's a deprioritization of your account that when you post to your audience, only a fraction of people can see it. So this is a way of um, roughly quarantining dissident political narratives into self-contained groups. There's, I think, broadly agreed upon um, risks that happen when people are deplatformed, that this actually increases radicalization and it, it results downstream in, in dangerous and antisocial behavior and all sorts of things. So it is, um, th there are certain measures, you know, cost benefit analysis in different cases, but largely um, it is better to keep people on the platform, but to keep their voices very, very low uh, versus, you know, being able to spread misinformation and, and all sorts of things that really ramped up during the, uh, during the pandemic. So shadow ban is, you know, say you have a, a hundred followers and you post it, you expect your hundred friends to see your post, 10 of them are going to see it as opposed to the, the other 90. Mm -hmm. It won't show up in their feed. That, that's just the, the quick explanation. So, mm -hmm. But um, what, what I wanted to um, um, try and demonstrate through this example is that I have since realized that there were certain um, affordances and the possibility of having other conversations in the old institutional structures that are just literally not possible to conduct on the platforms. So, um, so, so where do you go from here? Do you try to uh, rejoin the institutions? Do you try to stake out uh, you know, this, this increasingly marginal position on the platforms? I think what I've come to in um, alignment with new models and also interdependence through our project channel is that uh, institutions have a cyclical relevance. And there may be a period, I think largely is the case in the U uh, United States, less so for Europe, but um, they may be captured by certain interests, cultural, political interests, and they may have just uh, simply aged out where contemporary art will become something analogous to opera, which is like a time capsule of the period in which it existed. But this does not mean that the structure of an institution or, or the purpose of a media should be disregarded. We need new institutional structures to properly canonize, lend expertise, contextualize these works, because it, the, the only other viable alternative, which is posting to the platforms, is as shown through these projects, just not possible to do through the incentives and also through shadow ban and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I also just feel like Rhizome is a really good example of a sort of para-institution with the new museum that has been sort of shepherding in more kind of emergent behaviors and digital cultures of things that are just happening and affecting people's lives on the internet and being the ones to say like, this is important and this is something that needs to be looked at, and really kind of countering these old world notions of like what is tasteful and what is crass, which is where memes and internet culture just kind of gets, you know, get away. Yeah, 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 and I think, you know, if you, if you look back to some of these, the origins of these institutions, it, it can be as simple as something that was in, uh, a listserv, like it, it was an email blast, or it was a, a project space where, you know, a handful of artists used to just like, pin their friend's work to the wall. So they have quite uh, uh, humble origin stories. And you know, maybe this emergent behavior that has uh, uh, cropped up through social media in the last few years just needs a new generation of people to lend aesthetic expertise to those topics and uh, a, a new institutional uh, uh, place to show these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Um, do you want to respond directly? Because otherwise I would also kick it to you um, to sort of, because I think this, the conversation also differs a little bit between the US and Europe because the, the question when we talk about new institutions is always where would the money come from? We're currently in the Bundeskunsthalle, um, so in, in the, the uh, you know, federally funded institution in, in the former capital. In the US it's always, uh, it's often uh, unless, in a few, with a few exceptions, connected to well, very, very, very wealthy individuals. Um, and I was wondering if, uh, if that sh should play into where, like, where the new institutions could come from, where does one go to, to, to house and, and um, preserve criti criti criticality, criticism, and critique. Um, Jem, do you have a way to loop into that conversation? Um, I guess I have a response which is like in between two of like uh, both of your questions. Uh, for me it was a bit um, different in the way that like for example doing things like Patreon or crowdfunding wasn't so successful um, and I kind of yeah floated around a bit and then this uh, having a job as a cultural assistant was the main way I supported myself since like starting Freeze that was the yeah biggest chunk of this I guess um, and then beyond that for me it's more about um, first of all, like uh, maybe uh, having uh, some ethical consideration or some sort of consideration of like conflicts of interest uh, while accepting uh, invitations. Uh, and beyond that, it's uh, I'm more interested in doing things that kind of keep memes as digital first entities, artifacts, whatever you want to call them, while creating physical projects that kind of support that narrative. That like I think I also don't agree that like a blanket no on doing physical projects is the right thing to do just because digital projects are more important. Uh, I am definitely more interested in just making memes online and just posting them. But then I think if an opportunity arises, then it is possible to use it in a way that would give credit to memes as culture, as digital folklore, uh, and kind of support it from uh, below, let's say. And because I think the typical examples of exhibiting memes are usually just like, I don't know, making paintings of them or like posters of them. And I think that totally ignores the semantics of memes and like what memes mean. And because they're not so much about what are, what, uh, what are in the images, but more about how images circulate. And when you turn into a painting, you kind of assume that painting is superior to digital culture and kind of you try to reach that level and turn it into like a tangible object. Uh, for me, it's more about also to support myself now. At like, for me, this, like these days are kind of like a turning point and like trying, experimenting with all of these. Uh, I'm more interested in doing things that kind of situate memes in uh, like physical spaces, objects, and then turn them into things that people can purchase, like maybe as multiples. As for me, for example, zines were the most uh, interesting and successful uh, way to support myself or like create a model, so uh, that kind of stuff interests me more. I think it's interesting that you said uh, that you talked about memes as sort of working from below is what I think you said, which sort of gives them, which suggests that there's still some uh, leftover idea of th that they can positively, uh, sort of the logic of memes, the logic of platforms can positively di disrupt uh, um, sort of a staleness that happens in other places. And I thought it was interesting that you, I think two days ago maybe, posted about, so now we can talk about a, a moment, in, a recent moment in the art world of uh, people, um, I don't know, throwing, vari throwing various foodstuffs on, um, on famous oil paintings uh, around the world. And <laughs> you and I spoke about it, uh, and yeah, and, and uh, you said soup cans, in Germany it's mashed potatoes generally. Um, and it was interesting that you posted about, which is something that, you know, the legacy media and newspapers have been very uh, upset by, but you posted about that uh, in, a, in a positive lens as sort of something that you admired. Can you uh, talk about your view of these events and how you think they work with different logics and different attention structures? Um, yeah, I think I should uh, start by saying that, like, I'm not 100% um, sure, like, agree with or every action that these uh, protesters yeah. are doing. But what I find interesting in this discussion is 
not to consider them seriously and not give them any space. I think people are very, I think it's, uh, that's also what I realized uh, on my account that like I can really say that there were two subjects that got such an emotional and negative response uh, when I posted. One of them was Islamophobia and the second one was about these climate protests and people have very illogical arguments about why they don't make sense. Some people say that like, this is not how governments are gonna change, which I find really funny because I think that almost assumes that museums are not spaces where these discourses can happen and kind of really like in a glorified way, they just say that museums are apolitical basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, in that way, I find it very interesting that these, and then people, there's also like a whole, uh, through posting these memes, I got some um, interesting examples of, uh, I think it's Brian Eno uh, who, I have to say, like, um, basically seeped his uh, urine into a, a Duchamp, uh, like, fountain sculpture at MoMA mm -hmm. in the 90s, or, like, there's, like, a whole tradition of, like, damaging, uh, well, I think his name was Pinocelli, who destroyed two of uh, fountains, uh, like, the two of the replicas, as a statement, and then these are kind of always seen from a critical point of view, giving these uh, people take these actions some benefit of the doubt in what they do, even though I actually agree with them even less than the protesters themselves. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's just, to me it's just weird that these people don't get the, like they're not, even in those protests when they, uh, the, the things that they say on camera are not like taken, no one responds to them in the art world. Mm -hmm. I think that what the protesters are kind of enacting is the fact that, you know, Carly and Julian mentioned earlier, the Van Gogh is the meme, and they are attaching their actions to a culturally significant image and amplifying their message through that, which is a pretty known, you know, internet tactic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think maybe that, I don't, I don't know if you want to talk about this now, but just in as much as museums are meme factories, Mm -hmm. uh, more and more every day. Mm -hmm. So putting them in opposition might be a kind of false. Mm -hmm. False dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I, I like to look at this framing that uh, the platforms created the incentives for people to go, to go to museums and destroy artworks. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a war that's an infra- ruling class dispute about how culture should be organized mm -hmm. and that there's a portion of that that prefers the museum structure and there's a portion that prefers the platform structure and those are the forces that are really duking it out in society that that's what's shaping the world so a lot of times when we you know parade in our like uh, stinky anarchist larp we are doing the dirty work of somebody else who's pulling the strings behind the scenes so i i mean my sense is that with the financialization of art, um, there are, there's very few places in society, uh, you, you had mentioned that you know, museums uh, should be a place where these conversations can happen. I think, it's, I think it's more of a problem that there are such, so few places in society where you can have these conversations, uh, just you know, abstractly, conceptually, uh, where could you imagine going to destroy a multi-million dollar object? <laughs> There's not many places in society where you can access it. Uh, and so uh, coordinating something as simple as a reading group of like radical politics in, in New York. I, I mean, my experience is really specific to the States, but I think the States is that model is kind of slowly being rolled out to everywhere else. Um, you know, where can you have that conversation? Not many places. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I worry that um, what's going to happen in this course of financialization is that the increasing political instability, I think there's a hazard in this conversation generally that we have not, um, we're extrapolating out curves that are very unsustainable. And so what, you know, the, the waning possibilities for criticism should do is to prove correct over time, that we are like in a way trend forecasters in our critical analysis, right? That we're like, we're holding, uh, <laughs> to make a crypto analogy, like we're staking out a position that we know is going to be correct or valuable in the future. And we're doing that against the odds right now. So uh, imagine, if you will, a world in which the art world has been completely uh, financialized. Museums are under um, increasing stress and attack from activist groups under uh, conditions of political instability. And um, 
what you see in that model is that the institutions are becoming less uh, accountable to a public. They're, they're having um, less of a uh, impact on, on the asset price. They're, they're increasingly inward and elite focused. And so the activist attacks on art are going to become the excuse for museums to finally close to the public. And then you get just totally inward elite capture of cultural institutions, pure financialization, no public accountability, and you get a political dystopia because these activists are just wrong in their prescription. They're like, <laughs> I mean, we're like the idea of like, okay, we're, we're going to power our society just uh, as long as the sun shines and, and, you know, it's not cloudy or like it doesn't rain or whatever. Um, some of these ideas are just, are just flat out bad, right? These are like actually very, very minoritarian ideas. So um, yeah, I see, I see different factions now being instrumentalized by these two ruling class interests of uh, broadly in a cultural sense, aligned with the platform, aligned with the institution. And, um, you know, we, we are more or less like pawns uh, choosing temporary alliances and critical support with one side or the other to, to further our agenda. But I think this bodes uh, very, very poorly for our field, uh, the, these activist attacks on art. Hmm. Um, yeah, just moving forward, I just want to say that uh, actually like, I guess 98% of these protests don't have any intention to harm these artworks, or they didn't, because these kind of paintings, especially, are the, the next always one will. The next one will. These are the incentives. You get more and more views, which is what the platforms have designed. That it, when someone finally does destroy it and it's not behind glass, that's going to outperform a million to one. That like, oh, this one, you know, the but next I, comment doesn't say it's actually safe. Don't worry. I, I, th I have to say, I think that's like a shallow reading of this because I first personally don't, don't feel like not because I agree or disagree with what they do. Uh, but I just don't feel like I'm in a position to criticize them unless I do offer an alternative uh, in, in forms of protest to what they do. In, like, and also considering the imminence of climate breakdown and how real this is, like even just this year, all the things that happen in the world, even in Germany, uh, on the Rhine, how like these are very uh, clear signs of what we're going through. So like unless I can personally do something that is an alternative to what these protesters are doing, I'm, I feel like I'm not in a position to criticize what they do because they have no intent of harm in doing this and they are not harming these artworks. And I think we are in a desperate situation to kind of draw attention by any means necessary. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah. Just to get into it. Um, <laughs> if I can just build on that scenario that you're outlining. One institutional response that doesn't you know, that protects their own assets but doesn't really negate the act of protest is shifting their activity onto the digital sphere. I could see that in some boardroom being the discussion. Well, why don't we kind of take more activity if there is like a kind of increased closure or threshold to a public, let's move things into the digital space, which then mm. kind of loses mm. one of the major assets of a museological structure and institution, which is the physical space, ability to con conduct these conversations in person. So that is, I mean, this is really like throwing the ball pretty far down the line, but I would see that as being, um, you know, kind of a shame because I think what museums have kind of realized is their asset over the last 10 years. And you saw this in New York a lot with like PS1 or the Guggenheim kind of renting themselves out as a venue, new museum as well. Yeah. Um, is the museum as real estate is like really quite um, like formidable function that they can have for a public. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I imagine a, a version of this to <laughs> just extrapolate uh, a little further that imagine a museum that's so hollowed out that it has to close to the public because uh, of activist stunts and then it just literally becomes a content production media company where they're a YouTube channel or, or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that we should, we should make explicit here, and this is more so the, uh, the dynamic in the States, but like the place that the, the, you know, American museum funding comes from is like the reason why the donors are so enriched is because everyone else is under conditions of severe austerity. Yeah. And so the reason why people are taking these dramatic actions is because there's no other political action. Like they are desperate. I, I completely agree with this. But I'm, I'm not sure that these actions are actually going to further uh, 
a, a, a solution to the, the problem of like uh, tightening budgets and austerity and, and declining quality of life. Um, I think that this is uh, a moment of elite reckoning that um, we, we may have actually very little influence on, right? It's going to be decided in a closed room of whether they, uh, they want to allow art to turn into purely financial asset and close institutions to the public, or if there's a bit of reckoning, which you know, may, may be in the grand scope of neoliberalism in, in the late 20th century, that a lot of these ideas, uh, the kind of like Milton Friedman, Hayek ideas of like how you would organize society and what free markets meant and um, all of those things that are really, in, in an ideological sense, anti-institutional and that they um, depend on like the, the, the integrity of price signals to direct resources and attention and whatever, those ideas went into the design of the platforms. If you get an Audible subscription, if you get, uh, it's part of Amazon, right? You get a complimentary free copy of the audiobook of The Road to Serfdom by F.A. Hayek, yeah. right? So I think there's a, re there's a real conflict uh, uh, that, that's emerging here. And, you know, we may, um, I'm hopeful that there's enough of uh, a, a few legitimate, uh, uh, you know, um, well-intentioned people in the room that they will recognize that this period of elite reckoning has to be met with a, a really sizable ideological shift. It's being played out in the arena of cultural institutions, but I don't think that we are powerful actors in, in, in this game. We being? We as artists, as critics, as um, you know, uh, uh, participants in that, that world, uh, you know, people who make content or, or voice opinions. I mean, I would also say that the trend in exhibition, you know, content over the last however many, let's just say 10 years, isn't about putting more Van Goghs on the wall. It's about putting more Piplotty wrists. Mm. You know, it's, it's really kind of, you know, not necessarily ivory towering even more than, they all, than museums already are, but it, it is moving towards this like experientially fueled democratization of art in order for those spaces to kind of produce content that then exists on Instagram, which then feed back into the cultural validity of the institution again. So I don't, you know, foresee people throwing cans of soup or potatoes at like a, in a Yayoi Kusama infinity room, though that image... <laughs> Sounds so good. That's a, that's a good meme. Yeah. That would More do well. That would be <laughs> ice cream, yeah. Excellent. Uh, at least you can just squeegee the thing. It's exactly. Like, it's already behind glass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, but to, to maybe abstract from food, various foodstuffs in museums, uh, I think what we're sort of getting to is some, something of an idea that different forms of in, uh, distribution of information have inherent pol have or don't have inherent types of politics and. And Josh, you, you, start, you, you referenced your book Politogram earlier, um, which, which sort of uh, traced a certain uh, section of radical, on, like radical uh, politi young political radicals on Instagram and other places. And now, um, and so, and, but now you're also saying, if I may sort of translate that, there's different rich people at work in, in institutions and in platforms. They, they have just read different books, basically. The, 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 new, the billionaires that are running the platform have read uh, ca uh, sort of capitalist, econ like, and ha have read Hayek or various anarcho-capitalists. And, um, and the question is then, is there at all a meaningful difference in the inherent, inherent politics between these different uh, media? Is there, do, you, do you have political... Uh, choices at all in where you distribute anything? Like, do you think about that at all? Sorry, I a wordy question, but... I, I think the hope is that we could... Uh, so let's analogize um, New York Times over here, Substack over there, um, uh, cultural institution over here, influencers over there, um, you know, broadly in this... this uh, two-sided framework. Um, if a narrative is not sufficiently represented in the legacy format, what alternative media should do is create the strong signal that collects people to gather under a set of ideas, and then building sufficient interest in those ideas, the most activated uh, following of, of you know, that audience will then become uh, members and found some type of organization. And um, you know, then that can become a competing structure to the, the legacy media, political party, what have you. Um, so so it's, it's a 
curious landscape where um, I think the, you know, the, the hope is that through creating that strong signal, you want to build something that can uh, uh, upset or, or incorporate a narrative into um, an institutional structure that, that seems to be missing from it. But the particular way in which our media ecosystem is designed now is really, really oppositional to those things. And it creates fandoms, it creates things, uh, uh, audiences that follow um, sensationalism and outrage and all sorts of like divisive, uh, you know, uh, nonsensical tabloid type of uh, low information understanding of, of these issues. And um, we have, I've written a, a bit about this that I'm hopeful that some of these new emerging monetization schemes um, will uh, allow for different uh, formations to, to exist. Like you've seen influencers mobilize their following to do uh, political canvassing and things like this. And you've seen in some instances, political organizations form out of Twitch streamers, content creators, uh, things like this. Like there are inklings of that happening, but it's really, really the anomaly. The overwhelming majority of these spaces is that you just get audiences that are kind of lizard brain dialed into cooking videos and porn and prank videos and like, you know, the, the stuff that thrives in the internet environment. Uh, so, um, yeah, is it is it going to be uh, possible to, to do that? I'm not I'm not totally uh, sure, but um, that would be that that would be the hope, you know. At least like that that's what the implication could be. That you start a magazine, it culminates in an organization a few years later that is an institution or a political party or or whatever. So maybe like where we're at today, though, is legacy media, legacy institutions looking at what is happening in these more kind of grassroots, dark forest communities and using, uh, you know, a lot of the materials that are getting shared around on discords and whatnot as like citational references that then get sucked back up into the like aggregator, you know, New York Magazine article version of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't necessarily know. I think that we're just like in this, in this like cloudy moment where both of these things are existing simultaneously and legacy media is still trying to like, fun or legacy institutions are still trying to function as like context rich and are maybe information poor and are looking to more of the kind of community or mimetic, you know, engines for that information. So I think we're, we're, we've been moving between a bunch of and we can decide whether the utopian or dystopian future scenarios that we've scoped forward a little bit. So unless we need to say something uh, before we open it up, I think we'll, we'll, we'll open it up to questions a little bit before, before our allotted opening time, um, if that's all right. So um, if you want to join our discussion about um, institutions, uh, platforms, um, and so forth, uh, or about anything else that we should have addressed, um, we'd be happy to, to take the questions. There's microphones somewhere over there. And <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this. Um, I'm just curious. I mean, you're, you're always talking about sort of this meshing of legacy institutions and this other thing. What are your ideals then? I mean, honestly, I mean, would you like to be out there in the real world? Um, is, it, is it, what is it, or where do you want to exist? Um, do you have someone that uh, question is particularly directed towards? No, or is because it just you're all the... kind of wavering sometimes, and, I, and I, yeah, and that's sort of, it just kind of interests me that way. I mean, because there's a lot of this discussion away from the keyboard, you know, there's all, the, all that kind of interpretation as well. And it's, it's, I know that it's really hard, and that's why I'm trying to understand it myself. <laughs> and so how, how is it that you want to exist? Would you rather just sort of be? Um, Touch Earth. Yeah, <laughs> you, do you want to be on Earth? Would you like to be on Earth? Do you want to get rid of the legacy institutions? Um, do you want to get rid of, rid of like, oh, I mean, you all said with Condé Nast buying everything up. I mean, how do, how do you do it? How do you exist? And I think that that's really, it's a, it's a dilemma. And I see this dilemma in your discussion, and I'd just like to know where you'd like to be. 
I, I can just go off on that one. Yeah, please do. Um, I mean, I, f I feel like I'm a very social creature, and I think that all of the uh, <laughs> all of the organizations and collaborations that I've worked within have been uh, working towards a kind of tight communal sphere of discourse amongst peers. I feel very much a part of a community, and for that, I'm very thankful. I don't think that the you know touching earth on the keyboard dichotomy is reflective of the existence that we live under and that is just the reality that we're we're parsing but in terms of like you know am i only interested in existing in an online community i mean i think that some of these like literal new models and new models that are emerging are about kind of like bridging bridging those two things and i think that we've seen a sort of shift especially during covid of the internet becoming a much smaller place with fragmentation away from some of these you know big platforms towards the kind of cozy net on, um, you know, that meshes like a Discord, a Telegram, a, you know, WhatsApp group and all of that. I mean, I think in a very abstract way, the ideal is to kind of create a, a structure where you are like, you can pay your bills, you know, like you have a sort of like a regular form of income that doesn't compromise your critical position. And that can take different shapes. I think we are in like a very fluid period for all of this. Um, so it's just, I think we are all kind of having our own attempts at trying to do this with the opportunities that come or with things that happen. Um, and I think this is actually the case for anyone uh, too. Like I think it's the same with being a critic hired by a newspaper uh, too, that like that's actually not a very different model than this. Mm -hmm. Uh, just from a different age, um, so it's, yeah, I don't really see a conflict in that. I think it's a it's a more uh, fluid question. Mm -hmm. I I think there we can bracket out various uh, scenarios for this, but um, the you, you, uh, Carly, for example, uh, from New Models showed a, a graph um, in one of the talks earlier today where there was a um, the declining. Uh, uh, pay per word <laughs> of uh, uh, journalists, writers, and, and so on. Um, and I, I think it went from, if I recall, like, um, let's say 1980 to 2010 or something like that. Um, I mean, the, I think these are questions of political economy at a certain point, because the most preferable environment is to be in like the, the 1960s or 70s under like American New Deal liberalism or social democracy in Europe, where people get paid like $100,000 to mind a candy store, you know, and they don't really have to worry about what they're getting paid per word, because you don't have to earn a living through your creative work, right? And so that was, during that period, there was an elite consensus of how to organize society that allowed for much more prosperous conditions. And uh, culture flourished, given the, the right uh, political economic grounding uh, from which it could grow out of. And so we've seen a waning of that, which is uh, neoliberalism and then insult to, uh, insult to injury, that when institutions had, had already been like hollowed out from their, their funding and had to rely increasingly on private donors, then the platforms come in and it's just like the, the, the last nail in the coffin. And then not to mention that I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing something from uh, uh, Dina here that you wrote for Eflux, is that um, the, uh, Krusty the Clown is uh, saying that he will drop his pants for pay, and then you find out you go onto YouTube and somebody else is already dropping their pants for free. So, so there's no hope to get paid uh, whatsoever. So I think we can kind of calibrate back to... Um, there's an impoverished way to produce culture, which is uh, a distribution through platforms. There's a preferable alternative, which is institutional structures and philanthropy. And then there's the best case solution, which is political, economic, and not really within the purview of institutions. That is New Deal liberalism, social democracy in Europe, or just a uh, you know, general uh, Keynesian consensus among the ruling elites. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see a question immediately up. Maria is walking to, okay. No? Yes. yes, okay. Hi. Um, this is, uh, I'm too small for this, wait. Um, thank you so much for this um, incredible exchange. I am so full of uh, um, inspiration right now. Um, 
two ideas that I would love you to 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 keep on fostering and uh, practices that already show basically a direct connection to society uh, through the specific channels you have chosen. So I have three different questions here based on some notes. Uh, the first one would be to Chame. Uh, you refer to uh, the kind of work, labor that you do with memes uh, applied to uh, institution, uh, corpor corpor collaborations with institutions and that there is always this um, um, moment where institutions are ignoring the semantics or like how little internet referred to with the physics of, the, of this material, of this uh, of, of, of these channels, I'm one of the platforms of media. So I'm wondering, um, how can memes be this, if, if it's not, if memes are not uh, replacing anything, but are rather um, complementary to, um, to cultural shifts, how, um, how would you pursue a further uh, application of them into a, co a collaboration with institutions, if we agree that institutions are the places where this um, labor can be uh, better sustained for uh, all art workers. Um, the second would be for um, Joshua, um, the question of political economy and the, the way how um, how we create something meaningful in times of stagnation. So, how do you see yourself doing that in this not very um, clear process from meme to museum or from um, platform to institution? I would be interested in seeing what would be like ad hoc, a, a practical uh, step that you would give. And the third would be to, um, to Dina, um, this, the top-down nature of museums and uh, willing to be democratic. Um, or pretending to be, um, what would you uh, what would you suggest in that sense? It's like if this the pieces of content that we're all producing uh, come together in a meaningful way. Again, thank you. Three questions we can we can run with. Um, do you want to start, Cham? Uh, sure. Um, I think uh, first of all, I should say that. Um, I see like the exhibition of memes in institutions as like as one venue that uh, memes can be appreciated as cultural artifacts. I think they are already appreciated online and like they obviously reach more people online and uh, contribute to a conversation. Uh, but I also don't see any harm in also placing them in physical spaces if this benefits uh, this form of digital folklore, uh, let's say. Um, so in that I think yeah, it's all about uh, trying to keep uh, memes as digital first and then above these physical spaces uh, conceptually uh, and then they can be sort of diluted and placed in spaces to give credit or uh, bring more people into the conversation about memes. And one example of this for me was uh, like this uh, project I did at the Barbican was actually I took over the information monitors in the building and the idea was not to just put memes uh, on on the screens, but I think uh, information screens are quite interesting because they're also like some sort of social and digital space that we interact with, even though it's very didactic. Uh, so the idea was to take uh, text references from memes, uh, like sentences like um, birds aren't real, for instance, uh, which is this fake conspiracy theory making fun of conspiracy theories and then just placing this in a physical context. And Barbican also has a like sort of like an older, uh, let's say more conservative audience. So I think that juxtaposition was quite interesting. And the second aim of this was to actually kind of hopefully create a situation where these encounters of people with these odd texts would find their way back into the internet that kind of try to um, project memes into a physical space and then hope that they will have, again, digital reflections through that space and gain new meanings. Uh, and I think as long as this hierarchy uh, that keeps digital uh, memes above physical spaces, um, yeah, I have no hesitation to uh, do projects and think about it that way. <laughs> 
I'll uh, respond to Maria's question. Um, just, just to reiterate, it's uh, about uh, cultural stagnation and um, mm -hmm. how to find places for what I would describe as uh, taking creative risk, which uh, seems to be disappearing. Um, I think that uh, what you see in the fields of uh, cinema and in music is that we have now um, collected uh, so much data about these fields, about um, what will perform well. This is maybe, um, I'm sure Dean actually has thoughts about this in a marketing sense, but um, that you, you, you more or less are able to uh, market test before you make the investment. And so there's um, something like an early adopters benefit where we see legacy uh, IP like, you know, Star Wars or Marvel or these kind of infinite reboots that we seem to be uh, trapped in. Um, and then you see pop stars that uh, have, have very lengthy careers, whereas the new people relatively pop up and then, then d uh, disappear with um, increasingly uh, shorter careers. I think of um, the film The Irishman as a, as a perfect example of this, that it was... Uh, more cost effective to invent software to make Robert De Niro younger than to invest in the career of a new actor, right? So that, that's kind of like the, the ultimate example of like a, a stagnation in like a period of American history where the cost of living was, uh, you know, uh, only so much and um, there, were, there were more ample resources and then people could do this wild uh, experimentation, take all forms of creative risk because they were not dependent uh, or as dependent uh, uh, on markets to obtain the necessary goods for survival. So uh, during that period, like whether your painting show was a hit or a flop, um, you were at relatively lower risk to lose your uh, housing, energy, healthcare, uh, food, or what have you. And um, now the state for a lot of people who are, uh, you know, of, of the younger generation and, and certainly the kids who are coming up, um, if every show you produce is not a guaranteed hit, then the, the cost of failure is that you are uh, severely impoverished, burdened with debts, uh, unable to meet your overhead and, and so on. So, yeah, I think um, the the best example that we have for this, given the just practical realities, uh, are things like you try to um, find good actors in the current institutional structures that can subsidize the uh, tremendous risks and costs associated with uh, producing art. Producing art. This is how we find ourselves in institutions. You know. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and maybe I, I certainly I can relate to your experience as a as an editor and and having to facilitate projects against you know severe conditions for the the talent that you're trying to cultivate and promote. Yeah, and I guess to answer the question about what arts institutions can do in a turn towards whatever actual democratization might look like, I think. The Irishman example is really good because that's something mm -hmm. that art institutions can do is can take, you know, the old, make De Niro young again, but also put him in the context of like another young artist who might need that clout in order to sort of buttress their own, you know, market value or importance or canonization or, or whatever. I think that that's something that an art institution can do really well is contextualize the new and the old rather than sort of regurgitating in a pretty retrograde way of like the hits. Um, the other things that I think can happen just in, I understand this question is coming from like a, what are your solutions? Uh, sort of perspective, which I appreciate. And I would just say that like looking at what the material needs of those producing art and those receiving the art are. And like most artists that I know are time poor and poor poor. And usually the space uh, to produce work, the time to produce work that is remunerated in some form or another um, is something that an institution can do. And then the third thing, which I think that um, we haven't touched on so much is like, can the institution function as an archive, which is a resource that a lot of individual artists or communities can't really you know, afford with their own infrastructure. Rhizome, not to just like keep harping back on it, but like that is one of the larger projects that they're having is like creating a sort of living archive of a very specific slice and, and time span of net art. So I'd say that those are just a few. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything immediate coming up. I think one of the, uh, and I think this might be 
a place to sort of wrap up some ideas if we have anything else uh, that, that you guys want to add. But I, I do think one of the interesting things is that in a, in a pan panel that is called Memes and Museums, we didn't call it that, but um, um, that sort of there is this, the, the answer to criticism after Instagram is we should go back to before Instagram or with like a certain defense of, of, of institutions. And the, I think then the next question for that, that we can talk about also is that there's a reason why uh, people had a desire to move beyond institutions in the first place. And the question I think that's going to be interesting, um, and I think this is also, a, 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 for example, a difference between Germany and the US, it's harder to be really nostalgic about New Deal uh, 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 sort of time frames in Germany for obvious uh, historical reasons. And so there's, a, I think, one of the interesting things will be if we really do want to preserve institutions, if that is really something that we, that we uh, want and we think that they serve an important function, we have to think about how do we maintain them while also um, getting rid of some of the staleness, the, 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 the closedness, the, the, uh, the elitism, the racism, the so forth, that institutions have had in that moment too, in that historical moment too. And so I'm not saying that we can solve that in the, in the remaining six minutes, but um, I think that it would be my takeaway, that if, that if we agree that that is the project to build new institutions, the question is how can we build them in a way that it, that preserves that and avoids um, those pitfalls. Um. I mean, I'd say like in, in an <laughs> ideal form, uh, legacy institutions are pro-complexity. They're spaces mm -hmm. for discourse that afford a level of time spent with work and ideas. And that is something that is extremely valuable and is devalued on other you know, digital platforms that are kind of harping on your attention spans and whatnot. So I think that that is a critical element of institutions that may have been like kowtowed a little bit towards the incentives of social media platforms, but should be protected at all costs, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's an enormous frame, but I, I think what I would, uh, say in response to this is that um, the contrarian position of uh, you know uh, saying that platforms are a less preferable alternative to institutions is not meant to valorize all of the baggage that comes along with institutions mm -hmm. but I think in contrast to extrapolating out these curves a thing that we are very likely headed towards is so much worse than New Deal liberalism or social democracy or, or whatever um, under the conditions of you know a, a extreme climate breakdown, severe austerity, like on the the you know more dystopian end of the spectrum. So, uh, in, in hindsight, to elucidate uh, what was relatively more functional, not utopian, but relatively more functional, um, I think the power of that argument is that even given all of their compromised histories it's still better than what's coming up. And so it, it's actually meant to be a very like, uh, a, 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 an example coming already from a position of defeat to exaggerate or, or to not exaggerate, to emphasize how severe the consequences mm -hmm. will be in the near future. Mm -hmm. I think I have a, more of a romantic answer to this, uh, which is I think this is, yeah, I think also like using social media and also trying to navigate institutions in this way, I think the, my hope is to kind of invoke more like collectivism and more accountability in these structures and just normalizing that because I think uh, how institutions display art and like how didactic this is, no matter what they try, like the idea of, starting from the idea of a white cube, it's just very uh, unquestionable. And I think, um, and I think it's also important to distinguish between uh, people who use social media and then like, um, as you said, like that J-curve and like being on top of that J-curve uh, are more visible, but I think it's also important to emphasize that there are many people who can also use um, social media as a form of crit criticism, uh, even if they're like single stories and incidents uh, that happened. I think that's also like a very valuable way to kind of interact with institutions. And I think hopefully our work can kind of normalize that too, that like uh, 
other people's voices are also heard through this, that because this becomes a, a route that you can take to, uh, and use it as an open forum to interact with institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that is, that is actually, I think, a great way to end because we have, we have three di very different ways and the one thing that, they, that we agree on right now is uh, that the pro-complexity argument that there's a desire to keep things, keep things moving and keep things um, yeah, complex. And any last closing words? Otherwise, that's, that's, that's the closing words. Thank you very much for, um, for, sit for, for sitting with us for an hour and a half. And thank you, Jem, Joshua, and Dina.